last video, we discussed the basic predictions of transaction cost economics. Transactions, which differ in their attributes, will be matched to governance mechanisms, which differ in their abilities to manage contractual hazards in a transaction cost minimizing way. Most commonly, transactions that entail low levels of asset specificity will be governed through the market, while those that entail high levels of asset specificity face market failure and therefore will be governed through hierarchy, meaning inside the firm. This relationship between asset specificity and hierarchy is exacerbated in the presence of large environmental uncertainty. And when valuable knowledge is involved, transactions with high appropriability will be managed through the market, while those with low appropriability will be managed inside the firm. As we discussed, there are a huge number of empirical studies that demonstrate support for these predictions about organization form. But so what? Does efficient governance really matter for performance? The short answer is yes. But the long answer is that this is not an obvious outcome, and it's difficult to test empirically, so we should understand how scholars have reached the answer of yes. First, it is not obvious ex ante that efficient organization should lead to significant performance consequences. For one thing, notice that the studies described above did not actually measure the extent of transaction costs, which are notoriously difficult to measure because they include intangible costs, such as the probability that an event might happen. Rather, these studies measure the relative level of asset specificity in a transaction and rely on the comparative argument that greater levels of asset specificity will correlate with greater likelihood of hierarchy. For another, TCE operates at the level of the transaction. Economic activity usually involves a bundle of transactions. Think of all the things I need to do to produce and sell a shirt. I need to acquire inputs such as fabric and sewing equipment, access people to sew the shirt, find a place for the people to work, transport inputs to the site, arrange for security for the building, sell to retailers, transport the goods to retailers, provide customer service, etc. Each of these activities is composed of at least one transaction. Theoretically, it's not clear how badly my performance will be hurt if I have just one transaction misaligned. And competitive pressure will hurt my performance only if I face a more efficient rival. If most or all rivals are also misaligned in just one transaction, whether the same transaction or a different one, then I might not face competitive pressure to change or exit at all. Oliver Williamson offered a cautious assertion that inappropriate governance would negatively impact performance, suggesting that prolonged misalignment of governance would eventually lead a firm to fail over a five to ten year period if it did not correct its governance. In the 1990s and 2000s, scholars began to explore this question empirically. It's not an easy question to explore because of the problem of endogeneity. What is endogeneity? When we test whether appropriate governance leads to better performance, we would ideally take firms and randomly assign them to have good or bad governance of their transactions. Then we could see the effect of governance on performance. But governance isn't randomly assigned. Rather, firms choose how to govern their transactions, and presumably they choose the form that they expect will provide optimal performance. The fact that firms choose organization form with an eye to performance is the endogeneity problem. TCE scholars have applied three methods to overcome this challenge. The first relies on structural equation models, which use two-stage estimation methods to isolate the performance consequence of a governance choice after accounting for endogeneity. The second identifies a shock that changes the environment in which a firm operates so that it is suddenly misaligned with the new unexpected environment. The third focuses on the specific advantages associated with different forms of governance. For example, the low fixed setup costs of the market or the greater ability for vertical integration to facilitate coordinated adaptation and tests for these specific performance effects. I will give an example of one study that uses each method. Let's consider each study in turn. In a 1991 paper, Scott Mastin, James Meehan, and Ted Snyder studied the make or buy decision for a huge shipbuilding project. They used surveys to collect information on the characteristics of 74 components, including whether these were made in-house or outsourced, and the level of asset specificity associated with them. For those components that were made in-house, they also collected data on the cost of governing these transactions, all costs of planning, directing, and overseeing these components. They then used two-stage estimation methods 
to estimate the effect of transaction characteristics on governance costs for all transactions, whether make or buy. One benefit of these structural equation models is that you can use cost information on the transactions that were done in-house to infer the cost of the transactions that were done via outsourcing. The key result? Governance costs are roughly 14% of total component costs for this shipbuilder, and that's a lot. Equally important, the penalty for misalignment of a transaction was very high. The estimates suggest that choosing the wrong governance mode for a transaction for this shipbuilder would raise the governance cost by at least 70% and as much as 200%. Other scholars have used similar methods to look at other performance outcomes, including satisfaction with a transaction. They find that misalignment is associated with lower satisfaction, as expected. Jackson Nickerson and Brian Silverman provide an example of exploiting a shock in their study of the U.S. interstate trucking industry after it was deregulated, somewhat unexpectedly. Suddenly, firms that were appropriately organized for the regulated environment were inappropriately organized for the unregulated environment. The authors identified the extent to which each firm's type of traffic was based on specific assets or required time-specific coordination. They then linked this to appropriate reliance on employee drivers using company-owned trucks versus independent contractor drivers using their own trucks. Nickerson and Silverman found that misalignment in the driver transaction had a substantial penalty in terms of profit, with the average level of misalignment in the sample reducing return on assets by 20%. Further, misaligned trucking firms were more likely to go out of business than their counterparts that were appropriately aligned. Finally, let's turn to disentangling effects in clever ways. In a 2008 study, Sharon Novak and Scott Stern pioneered a clever approach. First, they noted that TCE generates specific predictions about which governance form will better handle certain challenges. In particular, the market is particularly good for getting things right at the beginning of a transaction, since parties will need to specify criteria and policies up front, and both parties have high incentives to get things right. In contrast, as time goes by and unexpected items arise, Hierarchy is particularly good for managing coordinated adaptation to address these items. Given this, market-based transactions should outperform hierarchy-based transactions at the beginning, but hierarchy-based transactions should improve performance relative to market-based ones over time. Novak and Stern take these insights to study make versus buy for component systems in the luxury automobile industry. Crucially, once an automaker decides how to govern a particular component system for a particular auto model, it does so for as long as it continues to produce that model. Novak and Stern collect data on the ratings of each system for each make and model by year from Consumer Reports, the dominant ratings organization for automobiles in the United States. They indeed find that systems with more outsourced components are better rated than those with more in-house components when first released, but that the systems with in-house components improve over the subsequent years that the model is produced, improve far more than the, those with outsourced components. Therefore, Governance choice generates performance consequences that are in line with the micro-predictions of transaction cost economics. Thus, we now have existing and growing evidence that alignment according to TCE principles is associated with better performance. Which leads to the next question. If misalignment harms performance, then why don't firms just change to proper alignment? Nickerson and Silverman, in the study mentioned earlier, explored this in the trucking industry. They find evidence that misaligned firms do indeed change governance so as to reduce misalignment, but that firms face adjustment costs when trying to change. In particular, the same features that TCE implicates as making firms dependent on others, asset specificity and contractual rigidities, can also make it difficult to unravel governance commitments, thus raising the adjustment costs for firms. So, economic actors do try to realign transactions, but they're constrained as to how fast they can accomplish this. Well, that concludes our discussion of transaction cost economics. In video one, we discussed the genesis of the theory. In video two, we discussed the theory's basic predictions for governance of transactions. And in this video, we discussed the theory's more recent evidence concerning the performance consequences of transaction misalignment and concerning firms' efforts to better align their transactions in the face of these consequences. I hope you've enjoyed our time together. So long.